Mariella, and thank you, Mariella, so much for leading. Oh, and thanks everybody for clicking whatever buttons Zoom asks you to click. And thank you, Mariella, so much for leading us today in community and connection. So thanks, Mariella. Over to you, my friend. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, everyone. Um, as many of you already did, feel free to turn off your camera if that makes you feel more comfortable. Feel free to keep it on, whatever makes you feel safe and comfortable. Allow yourself to do that. And as you find a comfortable position, something that feels relaxed, alert. And if you wish to, um, close your eyes. If not, you can just simply lower the gaze. And um, so yeah, we'll be practicing for about 20 minutes. I will ring the bell once to sign up beginning of practice and three times at the end of practice. If you like, you can use the sound of the bell as an invitation to, to bring your attention to this moment, to the present moment. yourself settle into the sensations in the body. So you bring all of your attention to this moment. I would like to invite you to start by taking a couple of deeper breaths. Taking a deeper inhale and inviting the body to soften. With the exhale, releasing any tension that you are aware that is present in the moment, that's present in the body. Dropping down the shoulders, softening the jaw, Maybe also taking a moment to orient yourself in the space you're in, and you can do that by by noticing the different sounds around you, those that are near and farther away. Noticing smells. Feeling the temperature of the space you're in. Using our senses really invite us to ground ourselves into the present moment. Bringing attention to the body, to sensations in the body. And noticing the different points of contact of the body with the chair, the cushion, the sofa, whatever object you are sitting or laying down on. Notice sensations in the back. 
the seed bones area. Notice the posture of the legs and the arms. Feeling the contact of the feet with the ground. And with a sense of curiosity and kindness. And to the best of your abilities, without judgment, take a moment of awareness of what is it like to just simply be here in this body, nowhere to go, nothing to do. Just simply being here. What is it like to be human right now? What is it like to be you? That thing that you call yourself. Peace that we call life. As we let the different parts of ourselves arrive to this moment. Recognizing what is here. What is it like to be breathing in this body? Bringing your attention to the breath. And with curiosity, noticing the different characteristics of the breath. Is the breath deep or shallow? Following the inhale and the exhale without needing to change the breath. Notice how you also don't need to make the breath happen. The body knows how to breathe. You are here witnessing the body breathing. Experiencing the aliveness of this moment with each breath. Maybe for a moment, just being grateful for these breath that nurtures the body, nurtures the cells in our body.
And very naturally, the mind gets carried away with images, with stories. And that's completely normal. Let's see if you can come back and return the attention to the experience of the breath and really experience each breath, the inhale, the exhale. And as the body continues to breathe, I would like to invite you to expand the attention now to the whole entire body. And notice what other sensations are present in the physical body. You may notice sensations that are pleasant, sensations that feel unpleasant. And there are some that are neutral, even though those are less interesting for the mind. Maybe also taking a moment to notice what's the overall state of the body. Is your body feeling rested, tired, energized, low energy? Just being curious and to the best of your abilities allowing this moment, this experience, even if it's just for one moment, to be exactly as it is. The beautiful thing about this practice is that this is a moment-to-moment -moment awareness. can do this just one moment at a time. I'd like to invite you now to notice what's the overall state of the mind. the mind feeling busy, is it feeling loud, quiet, perhaps there's even a sense of weight. Are the thoughts feeling heavy or light? somewhere in between. And again, this is just an invitation to notice with kindness, with curiosity, what's here without needing to go into any specific story. And if that actually happens, that's okay. You can notice that that happens and come back to simply noticing. Notice how thoughts are arising and passing by. Thinking is happening.
bringing awareness to the heart space and noticing what's the overall state of the heart. Maybe noticing what emotions are present. And again, just to simply recognize what's here, what's present in this moment to the best of your abilities without going into any story or trying to get rid of anything. Well, that's very normal. See if you can just hold awareness of the emotions that are here. Emotions may also be experienced somewhere else in the body and not just necessarily in the heart space, maybe in the belly area. And so just noticing that, again, emotions, phenomenon coming and passing by. You're sort of the host of this experience. These experiences, emotions, sensations, thoughts are not personal. You're hosting them momentarily. And holding that experience with love, with loving awareness, with kindness, compassion. As we let them move through the body. It's all welcome here. There's nothing wrong with any emotion, any sensation, any thought, any experience. They're all welcome to arise and pass by. Looking at the whole human experience that includes sensations, thoughts, emotions. Can you allow yourself for just one moment? Allow this moment to be exactly as it is. What would the experience be like if just for one moment you don't like or dislike this experience? Would you find some freedom? This is just an exploration. If it's not available in this moment, you can notice that. And hold that in awareness with love, with compassion and understanding.
And as we approach the end of this practice, I would like to end with bringing attention to gratitude. And I would like to invite you to find something that you can be grateful for in this moment. Perhaps a part of the body, a person, an event, a pet, an object. Whatever that is, big or small. And notice how gratitude is experiencing the body and where in the body you experience gratitude. And really let yourself be present with that experience as well. Getting more familiar with the experience of gratitude and how that feels in the body. And I would like to invite you to also take a moment and find gratitude for yourself. For having made the time to be here. You could have been doing something completely different, but you chose to be here to show up for yourself in this way. To be with you in this way. And that's not always easy. So I'd like to invite you to honor that. To me, that feels like an act of radical love and radical acceptance. Perhaps these can also be for you. beginning of radically accepting yourself, loving yourself. And so when I ring the bell, without rushing at your own rhythm, bringing movement to the body and letting light, colors, and shapes come to you, and also see if you can make the rest of this time together, the rest of your day, Make it a continuation of your practice where you continue being aware, being present in the body, being curious, being kind, holding kind attention. And to the best of your ability, just holding acceptance of this moment. If you wish to come back to the screen. Thank you all for your practice, for being here. I'm excited about our topic today. And yeah, what an important topic we all experience, loneliness. Thank you, Brian, for teaching us today and sharing more about Loneliness, something that perhaps maybe every single human in this world has at some point experienced that. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Mariela. And thank you for leading us in the sit today. So glad we could all sit together. It's a very intimate thing, <clears throat> very intimate. Um, 
I remember I took my first mindfulness class. Mary, I, I may not have told you this, but the first time I took a mindfulness class, it was maybe like eight or nine years ago, I think, maybe. And uh, there was someone in there who had been meditating for, she said she'd been meditating for 10 years, I remember. And she said that after 10 years, she had just recently been able to string a few days together where she was had successfully meditated five minutes for for like a full week in a row you know so she said it took me 10 years to be able to meditate for five minutes a day for a full week once a day and i remember thinking like what like <laughs> you can't meditate for five minutes for seven days in a row what's wrong and then i started meditating and then i realized why wow, it's so challenging it's 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 simple but it's not easy and I, yeah, I'm, I'm lucky if I have a few days in a row where I meditate for five minutes. So I just want to acknowledge that it's so much for me easier. It's not easy, but it's easier to meditate with people. And maybe this was never meant to be done alone. So, so thank you, Mariella, so much. Welcome, everybody. We're still the Inside LA Mindfulness and Deep Suffering Practice Group, Affinity Group. This is a great group. We like to call this the Hope Group, Healing Ourselves through the present experience, H-O-P-E, healing ourselves through the present experience. And today I'll give a brief teaching on, mindf uh, on mindfulness, <laughs> on loneliness. And uh, I hope it's helpful or interesting or a benefit if I cause any harm in this presentation or talk. Please know it was not my intention at all. And so why don't we jump right in. And I have some pretty little slides that I'd like to share. This beautiful purple background. Okie dokie, let me move my mouse so it's not annoying. Okie dokie. So, and I, I am, just for the record, I am not going to be singing any Hank Williams or any Elvis, even though that is the title of that song, and I desperately want to sing, but not while it's being recorded. But, but how many of us, certainly me, have felt so lonesome, so it's like hungry, hungry for connection, and um, cried, cried. And I, I know that when I've cried, when I have been lonely, um, it's helped. You know, I feel my tears. What was on the inside is now on the outside, and I can feel my tears. This teaching is not about crying and tears, but I wonder why crying felt, it didn't fix the loneliness, but it did feel, feel right. Anyways, I'm going to move on. So lonesome I could cry, mindfulness, deep suffering, and, and loneliness. And I've drawn from Brene Brown's Atlas of the Heart, and I've also drawn from a fascinating article if anybody's interested in learning more about some of the exciting research that's happening right now. In fact, there's some pretty exciting things that just got discovered or researched and the research results came out. Um, but it came out of the, in, in 2020, right at the time of COVID. So a lot of this got missed, which is a real shame. But this article does a great job of highlighting some of the research and the things we know now and some of the mistakes that we've made in the past about misunderstanding what loneliness is. But first, animals. Look at the cuties. <laughs> look at the look at the eyelashes. Look at those beautiful eyelashes. My gosh. Gorgeous. Boy, look at this baby. <laughs> I don't know if he or she is yawning or saying hi. I'm not sure, but it's just adorable. And this is very serious. <laughs> this is the most serious gorilla face that I <laughs> just grumpy. Mm. Mm. Hello. Hello. I see dinner. <laughs> By the way, this is a wolverine. 
I've never seen a Wolverine before, only in cartoons. That's an actual Wolverine. By the way, I have shown many animals that don't live solitary lives, but sometimes spend time alone. Yeah. OK, enough fun. Let's get serious. Loneliness. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this gentleman, John Cassiopo, and his colleague, William Patrick. John Cassiopo is referred to as Dr. Loneliness. He spent his, a big chunk of his life studying loneliness. He died in 2018. And one of their definitions when they talk about loneliness is perceived social isolation. And I know the times that I've felt lonely, um, high school, perhaps, or at a new job. Uh, sometimes in a, in a relationship, definitely in a relationship. You know, there's people around me, but my perception is that I am disconnected and I'm, I feel like a lot, an, like an island, even though um, that's not, strictly speaking, the case physically. And this is a picture of Dr., or excuse me, John Cassiopo. Uh, and his research, his research has helped a lot of people, um, and it's fascinating. He talked about how loneliness, you know, we used to think about loneliness as, um, as a bad thing and that it was um, something that could be fixed with, well, just go, go, go to a coffee shop, you know? It used to be pathologized in the sense that, you know, just... Just, a lot of that, just. And I think people in here certainly understand the justs. And uh, Dr. Cassiopo talks about how loneliness, and I'll talk more about this later on, loneliness creates a, a sort of pair of glasses or a, a bias where when we are feeling, feeling, and perceiving to be disconnected, we see things through those lenses. We're quicker to see, um, to notice things that we might perceive as meaning somebody doesn't want to be close to me, for example. Look at that person standing. Look at their eyebrows. They don't want to be with me right now. Anyways, I just wanted to introduce this, this concept of how loneliness biases our thinking. And yes, uh, interestingly, in one of the studies that was conducted, they found out that uh, people who self-identify as lonely, so lonely people, would pick up on negative social signals, like images of 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 rejection. Right? Um, they would pick up on these negative social cues uh, twice as fast as people who were not lonely. And lonely people prefer to stand farther away from strangers, for example. Uh, lonely people don't uh, tend to dislike physical touch. Anyways, just wanted to share a, a few of these things. And as we've talked about before in this class, and I think everybody here knows, we are a social species, despite this society that many of us live in, where um, we are meant to do it alone, right? One of the many problems with this system, these systems that we're in, capitalism is one, where you got to go it alone, individualism, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. But that has never been, that's never been the way that we have survived. In fact, um, here's a picture here of children of the Ice Age. This is from about 14,000 years ago. And you may see these, it's a, it's a drawing, of course, but these, you know, these cute little kids. And you may see that on the far, well, our left, their right, there's a child who's wearing what appears to be a sort of bear mask hood with a with a mask. And it's fascinating the research, uh, archaeological research that is now happening. For a long time, people uh, in the archaeological community, everything was looked at through the lens of adulthood. So all fossil evidence was always seen as, okay, what were adults doing here? But now we are starting to look at archaeological evidence, looking at, well, what was childhood like 14,000 years ago? 
And by the way, 14,000 years ago is before we figured out farming, right? 14,000 years ago was a time where we were still wandering. And so this incredible um, a play was a huge part of children's lives, play and performing. Um, anyways, I just wanted to share why did I, why am I talking about that? Oh, social species, social, we're social. <laughs> and we need each other, of course, of course. When we are, yeah, I think Dr. Jamie talked about this too, you know, when, a, when we see a, imagining a, a, an infant, an infant baby on the sidewalk as we walk by, our natural inclination would be to, of course, help, help that baby. Uh, humans, we are maybe the species that takes the longest to grow into maturity. It takes most humans, what, 24, 25 years for the brain to be fully developed? Um, it takes us a long time. We need each other. So here's a fuller, uh, a bit more about the definition Brene Brown talks about, the absence of meaningful social interaction, an intimate relationship, for example friendships, family gathering, uh, com community work groups. By the way, this is a community. This is a s mean, for me, and I don't know about how, for how many of you, this hope group is a meaningful social interactive community where uh, personally I feel safe. It helps with my loneliness. Now I want to share a little bit um, about Again, I was talking about this research that just came out. Well, let me just share some examples. I had a good cry about two weeks ago, and it felt so good to be held in this woman's arms as I cried. You know, we're talking about meaningful social interactions. And how many of us have felt we wanted to cry and we wanted to be held and consoled, you know, and not the kind of like patting you on the back. Okay, shh, 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 shh. No, but just being held and seen and held and seen for our accomplishments too. And yes, this is a picture of the Canadian Olympic curling team <laughs> being in community, working together. I could have picked a better picture, but I just thought curling is just delightful. Sorry. But working together in teams, being in community for a, a higher purpose or a higher calling, meaningful social interactions with those who have died and still that connection. I know that the, I know because I'm a grief therapist and I hear it all every day, the loneliness, the one person that I would want to talk to about this is gone. The one person who I would want to talk to about my wife's death is my wife. Thank goodness, the loneliness that we feel in grief, there are ways to remain connected. And I think I've talked about this before, and it's not the topic of this talk, but the continuing bonds theory is in grief is um, really helpful to a lot of us. Not if, but how can we maintain connection across the divide of life and death? And I wanted to say a little something about loneliness and stress. You know, each of these are unpleasant, no doubt about it. We used to think that loneliness was all bad. Loneliness was something that was, uh, there's a definition that Brene Brown shares. I didn't put it on the slides, but let me just read it out loud. Kind of has some yucky words, so I'm glad I didn't put it in the in the PowerPoint. We used to define loneliness as a, gnawing chronic disease. And that cr gnawing chronic disease was without redeeming features, had no redeeming elements to it. It was all bad, 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 bad. And loneliness used to be equated with shyness, depression, being a loner, being antisocial, Having bad social skills. How many of us have been accused of, oh, it's, he doesn't know how, Brian doesn't know how to play with others. Yeah. And isn't it interesting how we even further demonize in that word, you know, the, 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 the lone wolf, 
right? That criminal was a loner, you know, the guy who was robbing all those banks. He was always a bad apple. Even as a kid, he was a loner, you know? But loneliness and stress, both of which are unpleasant, but they're not necessarily negative. You know, each of those, and we'll talk a little bit more about it later on. I'm going to try to speed through this a bit. Um, but each of these loneliness and stress, you know, they create, it's like a check engine warning light in our car, you know, some ping, ping. And it does generate some energy to the body and certainly stress and also loneliness. It does give some energy. It wakes us up to there. There is something, something's up. Something is not. There's something is out of balance, and it, that energy can help with dealing with challenges. Here's a few examples. Stress. Yeah, helpful. Maybe lonely out there too, in the middle of the intersection. Stress. Helpful. Stress. Helpful. Stress. Loneliness. Yeah, helpful. This is a picture of a what appears to be a gentleman working on a keyboard while walking on a treadmill. Now, this picture is meant to illustrate that loneliness and stress, while not all terrible and crappy all the time, they cannot be maintained forever though. Chronic stress, chronic loneliness, and we definitely know this, it, it takes a toll on the body, it does. We all need our rest and recharge. This is a, this is a quote from uh, Miranda July's book about a person. It's really, I think is a sweet quote. This person realizes that staying home means blowing off everyone this person has ever known, but the desire to stay in is very strong. This person wants to run a bath and then read in bed. Yeah. By the way, there is a candle immediately underneath that woman's hair. That is not safe. <laughs> but besides the candle, sometimes we do want to rest and recharge and hibernate. And yeah, sometimes we want to escape into a, into a book. And mindfulness as a practice which doing one thing at a time, maybe some, maybe some of us feel lonely because our attention is scattered throughout the day. You know, we feel separate from ourselves because we're doing 11 things at a time. And so mindfulness is an opportunity to do one thing at a time on purpose without beating ourselves up over how we're doing it and coming home to ourselves and practicing taking care of what's happening inside us, not fixing, but taking care of. And these are some of the ways that I wish loneliness would go away. And maybe some of you can relate to this, you know, hoping, right? Hoping, wishing, fantasizing, dreaming. And this one here is, and I'm going to share a quote, a Dostoevsky quote in a second, a longer quote. But this picture is meant to represent a sense of fairness and balance in the world. Maybe some of you will relate to this quote and this concept that all will be made right in the end. My, my pain and suffering is not for nothing. And I'll read the quote. And you can follow along if you like. This is from the Brothers Karamazov. Some of you have read it, maybe. I believe, like a child, that suffering will be healed and made up for. That all the humiliating absurdity of human contradictions will vanish like a pitiful mirage. Like the despicable fabrication of the impotent an infinitely small Euclidean mind of man that in the world's finale, at the moment of eternal harmony, 
something so precious will come to pass that it will suffice for all hearts, for the comforting of all resentments, for the atonement of all the crimes of humanity, for all the blood that they've shed that it will make it not only possible to forgive, but to justify all that has happened. And I felt this way, the loneliness I felt. Someday they will know. Someday it will be okay. Someday all that was wrong will be made right. Like, like I felt like a child, and that child inside me still feels that way. I'd like to share just, just this reflection from Stephen Jenkinson, who most recent book on elderhood, but he's written books on um, grief and dying. His book, Die Wise, is excellent. He was at the bedside of somewhere between 800 and 1,000 dying people as a hospice worker and social worker up in Canada over his decades-long career. And he said that there was a, and I've, I think I've shared this before here, there's sort of a dirty little secret of the dying that they hardly will, they will barely tell him as the hospice worker um, in that sort of death doula role. And this is the dirty little secret, he says, of the dying that they would whisper to him on their beds to him. And they would say, I'm so scared that no one will remember me. That is my greatest fear of all, that no one will remember me after I'm gone. And if they do think of me, if they'll think of me fondly. The loneliness that people experience on their deathbeds that he shares having been there will anyone remember me this is a picture of albert einstein who was pretty smart and here's a picture of some other people who are making incredible strides in the field <laughs> do you like that transition uh or making incredible strides and again if people want to learn more about this um it's it really is fascinating uh this this a researcher's name is Jana Liebers. And she, again, just recently, this is brand new stuff. For a long time, people thought that, that loneliness was like a social, like a social anxiety in the sense that people, people who were lonely, it was believed that their amygdala, right? Amygdala, which is the part of the brain that is, is, is all about the fear. When there's fear, amygdala activates. So for a long time, we thought that like being afraid of snakes, right, or spiders. So the way that we treat, one of the ways that we can treat people who are afraid of snakes or spiders is to expose them to snakes and spiders. It needs to be done in, a, in an ethical and a responsible way, but essentially this exposure to that which we are afraid of. And for a long time, this is how loneliness was framed. Um, expose the lonely person to people like spiders and snakes they'll feel better and it turns out that this is absolutely wrong when they check to see the the amygdala activity of people who were lonely identified as lonely there was no amygdala activity it it wasn't a fear and and now it's also been proven that merely having social having people who experience oh yeah yeah having people who experience loneliness just merely being around uh people it doesn't work providing lonely people with easier access to potential friends has no effect on loneliness has no effect whatsoever i want to also share this gentleman by the name of daniel danilo Bzdok, Bzdok, and he talks about the, the downward spiral, the downward spiral that we feel. Because as we were talking about before, as I mentioned before, Dr. Cassiopo and his, the, how loneliness biases our way of thinking, pretty soon when we feel, when we experience loneliness, and then we tend to have a more negative spin right? Those glasses, that bias. So we have a, a negative spin on the information we're getting, right? Like, for example, I look at Mariella's face. See, I'm very lonely today. So when I look at Mariella, I am perceiving how Mariella is looking at me is, ooh, she doesn't want to be with me, right? Or I'm reading a text message from Mariella. 
and I'm saying, oh, she put a period at the end of that text message. She doesn't want to be my friend. It's 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 interesting. So the the loneliness experience creates a bias in how we see, which then drives me even further away from Mariella. Downward spiral, downward spiral. And again, for those of you that are interested to, to read more about this, and it's fascinating. Um, these are the, some of the largest studies that have ever been conducted recently on loneliness. Um, about a hundred times more people were studied than have ever been studied before in something that came out in 2020. So a tremendous amount of, of data behind this. And as I said before, more negative spin on the information we're getting. These pair of glasses. So what do we do about it? And I'm going to wrap up soon. And this is something that many of us with those glasses of loneliness experience. Day, I, drain, I daydream about social interactions. I get easily nostalgic about past social events, for example. I personally anthropomorphize pets. My pet is my baby. These are so just, again, there's no judgment, but this is some of the patterns that we see when we are wearing those glasses of loneliness and that it is a matter of survival. Absolutely. We were never meant to live alone. And so last thing I want to say, Dr. Cassiopo in his research says that instead of seeing loneliness as a bad thing, something that is like a snake or a spider that can be fixed, but rather that loneliness, like hunger, like hunger, hunger is a um, an an, ad an adaptive um, uh, motivation. Hunger motivates us to look for food. This is something that has evolved and we've adapted to. And perhaps loneliness is also something that we have, ha has evolved to, for our adaptation. Signaling that something has gone off, something is not right, there's something imbalanced. And you know, for our ancestors on the African savanna, this is a matter of survival. If you get separated from your tribe, it is a matter of life and death. So the, just like the feelings of hunger motivate us to eat, the loneliness might drive us to seek out the social connections that we, that we need. Connection. The need, and this is just the last slide, or two slides here. The need for connection in which growth is a priority is the core motivation in people's lives. Connection in which growth is a priority is a core motivation in people's lives. In growth fostering relationships, and I think this space here in the Hope Group between us, us this for me really feels like a growth fostering space. People are able to bring themselves most fully and authentically into connection. And connection, just as a last final reminder, connection is the energy that exists between us. When we feel seen, when we feel heard, when we feel valued, without judgment, and when we, when we grow together. And maybe all healing comes from connection and community, which is what we have been practicing for 14,000 years, 50,000 years, 100,000 years. Certainly, we've been practicing that in the last three years in the Hope Group as we sit together, not to fix loneliness, but to touch into and feel into and learn from in the same way that as we have the Sitting with Suicide series here, sitting with loneliness. And what can we learn? Instead of trying to fix loneliness, thank goodness we can. We can accept and then and, and yeah, and learn and learn from our loneliness and what it's teaching us. And like hunger, loneliness can teach us what we need to learn today. Yeah. So thank you for your kind attention. Um, as you could tell, <laughs> I had a lot to say. <laughs> um, and I tried to fit as much of it in as I could. And thank you for your kind attention. And I'm gonna turn off the recording so we can have community and connection.